Excellent. Hey, welcome everyone. This is our a part three of our biocontrol regulatory masterclass. Uh, it's the last in the three sessions uh, and we're really lucky to have Roma join us again today uh, for a fantastic session that she has planned for us. I'd also like to thank Valent Biosciences and Sumitomo Chemical for helping support this program. Uh, and we actually have uh, people from, from Valent actually online today. So uh, exciting to see them join us. Um, in the middle of their morning from the US. Putra is also on board. He's the project assistant and he's there to help us in the background. So thanks for that, Putra. And if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat. We've got not as many people as last time, although we've already got 30 uh, and it should, that will increase over time. But that also means that we've got plenty of time for real discussion as well. So we're really going to probably be unmuting people and allowing you to speak later on. So, so get ready with your questions. Um, I'm just going to move on to slide two, uh, Roma. And just remember that we're using the chat box really to ask all your questions, to share your thoughts and resources. Make sure you introduce yourself, which many of you have already done. Uh, raise your hand if you would like to ask a question uh, and you want to verbally say it, or you can just put it in the chat. Um, but also you've got a reactions button down the bottom there. And that's quite fun. It's, it actually gives some good feedback, uh, particularly to Roma when she's saying something that really resonates with you. So put your thumbs up, give her a clap if you think something's uh, really, really uh, pertinent to you uh, and important. Uh, it's a really nice way to sort of show your reactions and communicate uh, with everyone. So moving on, I'm going to just go on to the next slide and I can see already more people introducing themselves. Great to see people from Papua New Guinea uh, as well. Um, so nice to see you back. Um, and this is just what you already know, which is really just make sure you interact in the chat because it's a really nice way of catching up with everyone and finding out where there's people working on the same things. Now, this is the last part three, uh, and we're going to look at environmental fate and ecotoxicity. And this is really, while I say it's the last of three, it's also the start uh, of work in this area. So um, this is really giving us a sort of a basis to sort of look at where do we need to go next? Where do we need to provide more support? What kind of resources do you need to help you do your work better related to biocontrol and regulation? So we'll be coming back to you sort of uh, with questions over the coming weeks. Uh, we'll also be putting together a nice sort of report uh, and all the resources. Most of the resources are already um, online on the uh, videos page. There's the copy of the videos from part one and part two and also the PDF copies of the presentations. But we will definitely come back to you with more. So without further ado, I'm going to move on to the next slide. And I think that's the start of Roma's presentation. So Roma, welcome back. I um, would just like to congratulate you on the, the series so far. It's fantastic. We've had amazing feedback. Uh, we've had a lot of people answering the monkey survey, which was around giving us some feedback on, on the session so far and very high ratings and, and very um, a lot of people very happy and, and interested in talking further. So welcome and thank you. Thank you. That's very kind words. Um, yeah, actually, this sort of is my favourite bit. Um, this Of all the other things I've been through, this is the one that I, I, I really kind of enjoy. Maybe it's because I'm a biologist and this really makes sense to me. Um, uh, what, what we're trying to do, there's some other parts which I'm sort of sometimes think, oh, yeah, okay. So I want to talk in the session, we, we've, in previous sessions, we've talked about the aspects of safety related to human health, um, and we've and we've thought about um, you know what the substances that we're working on with are, um, what they look like, and how do we manage those. So, and um, what we're going to think about today is what happens when we put these products out into the environment. Um, what is um, what? Where do they go? What are the implications? Because this. Our concerns are not just about human safety, but environmental safety, and we don't want to cause unacceptable harm. So we want to um, understand sufficiently about the um, active substances and products that we're applying, so that when we're putting them out into the environment, we're confident that they're not causing unacceptable harm. So just as a little reminder, the substances that I'm going to really be talking about today are microorganisms, botanicals and semi-chemicals. 
and I'll address the environmental fate and ecotots of these groups, these three groups in the, the order that they're on here, which so I'll talk first about microorganisms, then about botanicals and then about senior chemicals. And I'm doing that because their environmental fate and ecotops considerations are really um, quite different. So part of what we're trying to do in this um, series is um, to think about what the, that regulatory process, and we know that if the regulatory process isn't adapted and doesn't consider these types of technologies and have skilled experts for these technologies, it can take a very long time. So if we look at somewhere like Kenya, Brazil, the USA, where they've got a specific regulatory system, it's, it takes a very short time. But we look at somewhere like the European Union, um, where it's a more, much more complex system, we can see that the regulatory process goes much slower. So what we want to do with this um, masterclass is to help the applicants and the evaluators to build the knowledge so that we can make this regulatory process go fast because there's so much innovation and there's so much demand now for products that can be used in IPM and these bioprotectants are products to use in IPM that we want to make sure that regulation isn't an unnecessarily high barrier. Um, but that said, we want to maintain a high level of protection of the human health and the environment, but not ensure there's extra barriers. Um, and so we want to take a simplified approach. And this is what the, um, the WHO FAO guidelines took as their principles when they were developed. So the basis, the underpinning sort of approach that I'm taking for this, this series has been using this guideline because it's the most recent guideline and it's probably the most thoughtful guideline on microbes, botanicals and senior chemicals. So why are these substances different? Just again, a little bit of a recap. Um, they're very different to sort of microorganisms, obviously living organisms, botanicals are complex mixtures and semi chemicals don't kill anything. So they're a very different situation. So because they're very different and because often they're substances which are really well known, a large part of the dossier can come from published literature and also sort of in-house studies of the mode of action and biology, which is something we, we talked about in the first session. So you'll see in a dossier, um, as an applicant, you should use this and as an evaluator to see this, you'll see a lot of reason cases and justifications and waivers. And this makes it a little bit more complex in some ways because um, you're having to read a, a lot of sort of good quality scientific literature. It's not just a simple study. This is the outcome of the study, yes, no. And when you look at dossiers that have been brought from other territories, um, it's trying to understand of that information that's provided, what's the useful information? What's the information that's in there to help me make a decision? An applicant should really be thinking about that, thinking about providing information that is useful for the evaluator to understand what their substance is, what's happened to it, so that they can make a good assessment. Um, the other thing, a couple of things I just sort of want to think about these types of substances. So often these active substances are formulated with um, co-formulants that are inert of no toxicological concern. And this is because the developers don't want to, um, that their active substance may have no classification. They don't want to have co-formulants in there which have a classification. Um, and their, their aim is to produce um, products for people, for growers to use and farmers to use that are not um, causing unacceptable harm. So they make sure their co-formulants comply with that approach as well. And the other complication is there's often no suitable or validated tasting methods. So what you'll see in a dossier um, as an evaluator is you'll see non-typical testing methods. Um, and as, as an applicant, you have to be really thoughtful about how you design your studies, not just to take a list off a shelf somewhere, but really think about what your active substance is and therefore what's going to happen to it, and therefore what studies do I need to think about doing so that I understand well the fate of the substance in the environment. Um, to make life a little bit easier, the FAO are developing this, this um, registration toolkit. They already have the toolkit for chemicals, but they're developing it for microbials. So for the microbials, at least, there's going to be um, a lot of this information I'm talking about is going to be available online. Then eventually there'll also be the information for botanicals and senior chemicals. But it's a lot of work, so it could just take a little time to get there. <laughs>
So we start to move into thinking about um, specifically the environment and non-target organisms. So I'm going to work with microbials. So in the other sessions, we've covered off identity, biological properties. We've thought about effects on human health and residues. So um, we've had in other sessions a discussion about efficacy. So today we're going to talk about the environment and non-target organisms. So just a little bit of a reminder is our ability to understand what happens to a microorganism in the environment is relies on us knowing what is in that active substance. And just a reminder that active substance can be the microorganism and the secondary compounds it produces, or you own, there's no secondary compounds and then we're only thinking about what happens if the secondary compounds are produced in situ as in, in the field. And that's true whether we've got a, a solid state production system or a liquid. Um, state production system. So what you, with a microorganism, you've always got to think about what the microorganism is doing and what any secondary compounds are doing. And this isn't about having to understand all the secondary compounds, it's thinking about the secondary compounds or metabolites that are toxicologically relevant. So you don't have to understand everything, you just have to understand if you have toxicity. And some of the indications that you might have toxicity would come from your human health. So, that, um, so for example, when you've done your human health testing, if you have no endpoints of concern, there's an indication that you haven't got toxicity there. But it also relates to your production process. And you, 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 so when you start to work with the microorganisms, you have to think about how they're produced. Um, and the other consideration is, WHO and FAO guidelines have said there are certain types of microorganisms which we know a lot about. And providing they sort of have these criteria, we may not even need to do the environmental and ecotox work. So that means if you've got a full and unequivocal identification, so you know that it's an insect pathogen or you know it's plant pathogen, you know there's a lot of good information, you know what it is. So you're confident in its identity. You um, have looked at the production process and you're sort of saying, well, look, I can tell from the production process or that the the applicant has provided evidence of it, there's no secondary compounds present or there's no toxicologically relevant secondary compounds present. Um, the, it's not been co-formulated with anything that is, is toxic. There's still viable material there. Um, and there is still information on the, on the phys chem properties for the, for the formulated product and no human pathogens in there that you could actually, you don't necessarily need to do any present any evidence around um, environmental faith and ecotots because we have an expectation. We know what these microorganisms will do and we know how rapidly they'll break down and what their present prevalence is relative to background levels. So it might be when you're evaluating the dossier that you actually don't even need to do the environmental and non-target testing and that's something to think about. So to do the to think about the environmental fate and to think about non-target organisms, we really have to understand very well the identity of the microorganism. And this is something we covered in the first se session. And we also have to understand very well the biological properties. So we need to understand its, its biogeography, where it comes from, what ecological habitat it, it, it's in, what its mode of action, the life cycle. So you can't proceed with the environmental and non-target work without really reading and understanding these parts of the dossier. They're the key to knowing what to do for environmental fate and ecotots. And it's just a reminder to the applicants. It's why this the biological properties part of the dossier for a microorganism is so very important, is you have to get that really done very, very well because the environmental and ecotots evaluators will be relying on that information to help them make decisions about what to do. Um, and I just, another reminder that we're, we're thinking about this for microorganisms, we're thinking about the microorganism itself and any toxicological effects from secondary compounds. And again, it's not understanding all the secondary compounds, it's just the, the toxic, any potential toxicity. So when we're thinking about environmental effects, we're looking at soil, air and water exposure. Um, now, if we sort of pick that apart to some extent, we 
don't really have an expectation the microorganisms are going to, to move into the air phase because they're microorganisms. Um, the air is already full of lots of microorganisms. We breathe them in every time we take a breath. So um, we're not out, when we spray the microorganism out there, there's no additional exposure. And actually there's some nice research which supports that statement that I'm saying. And then if we think about the water exposure, um, there's two aspects to that is mobility in water. Um, and microorganisms are not exactly going to move through the soil and into the water, but they might get there as spray drift or something like that. So what would happen to them in water? What you, it normally happens in water is the microorganisms settle out. It's not the habitat for microorganisms. If you're an insect pathogen and you end up in water, you're, you're just going to die. It may take a little bit of time, but essentially you're going to die. And you're certainly not going to find your hosts in the water. So a combination of sort of understanding the biology that you don't germinate in water, that the hosts for the microorganism are not in the water, and that they'll settle to the bottom of the water is the usual pattern. Again, you, you're, you don't have um, necessarily a lot of information is needed about the water. So most of the information and consideration you'll have for environmental fate for microorganisms is consideration what happens in the soil. Okay, um, so it may mean that you, there's, a, there's a minimal amount of environmental information that's required. Again, just emphasizing that a lot of the information that's going to be coming forward is going to be coming forward from studies and not um, sorry, from the literature and a small amount from studies. So something that I do sometimes is if I want to see what happens in water and to confirm what happens in water, I'll do a simple study with um, a column and I put some microorganisms on the top and look at how quickly they drop to the bottom and then look at what happens to them there. And that just supports the, what the information that's in the literature to say that, that the, um, the microorganisms before performing the way the literature says, um, and it's justification for non-provision of specific study data. Um, and it's also possible to um, think about the, the, the microorganism as to what environmental compartment it's, it's in. It's not going to be in all the environmental compartments. So again, just thinking that you're not having to necessarily look at all the environmental compartments. So the, the approach that I take is, it, it, it is a sort of, um, I think this, this diagram is, is really useful to help our thinking. It's a tiered approach. This is, um, I'm showing here the uh, flow chart that's taken from an EU document, but it's, this in itself was inspired by some work done by, first, by some environmental risk assessors. And I use this as, as to help my thinking as an applicant, but also to help thinking as, as an evaluator. So the first thing is, you know, is, is, is there enough information? Is the mode of action and the microorganism characterized in a good way? And that's going back to that section two of the dossier to say, what do I have on the mode of action? And then the next part is thinking, okay, how is this going to be used? So where will it end up in the environment? Will it end up in water? Will it end up in air and end up in soil? And I've already said that ending up in, in air is unlikely and ending up in water is um, not necessarily problematic. That said, as an applicant, you still have to provide that information. You still have to provide that reason case as to why that's so. So don't just leave a blank in that part of the, uh, the dossier. Um, as an evaluator, um, you know, if you've seen that blank, the applicant needs to fill that in and explain to you why there isn't exposure, but what you'll expect to see is a reason case. And then we'll move on to sort of, um, if, if there's no contamination to soil and surface water, you can go straight on to think about environmental toxicity. But if you do, if you can't exclude it, then you start to go to box three and think about, okay, what's happening to this microorganism? Is it going to accumulate? Will it multiply? Is it going to, and what you're always thinking is, is it being applied and is it going to um, proliferate in a way that there'll be more of it in the environment than the, you might find naturally occurring? And the answer is yes, there will initially when you make the application, but the microorganisms don't survive well often they, they're, they're degraded by biotic and abiotic processes and so they rapidly degrade. So there is some calculations you can do to look at if I put a microorganism out there when I spray it, how much of that microorganism will be there relative to what we know is in the background levels. And to get the information about the background levels, there's, there's some scientific publications that explain that. So as a broad rule of thumb, um, when we apply a microorganism, you'll expect to find about one times 10 to the three, one times 10 to the five CFU per gram of soil. 
And if you look at the literature, say for something like um, enteropathogenic pathogenic fungi, insect active fungi, the carrying capacity of the soil is roughly around one times 10 to the three times 10 to the five CFUs per gram of soil. So what you know is when you pick, somebody makes this application, they're not significantly adding to the number of microorganisms that could be invaded in the environment. Therefore, they can't be an additional risk. And you'll see a lot of dossiers make this kind of argument. And it's only if the amount that's been applied is significantly above background levels or the microorganism will persist for a long time. So a persistence for a short window of time is fine because you're not, again, having an unacceptable risk. It's when you've got its survivability at a high level for a long period of time, which would influence the microbial environment. But just again, thinking about microorganisms when we put them into the environment, the soil is stuffed full of microorganisms. It's just there's so much out there. There's a really nice piece of work that was done in, um, in Denmark, in fact, where somebody surveyed a field and they found 15 new species of, of metarhizium in this one field. So what we do is we completely underestimate the population of microorganisms that are already out there. So the amount that we're putting out, you know, I'm saying it's carrying capacity of a microorganism but biocontrol is about one times 10 to three or times 10 to the five per gram of soil. But the number of microorganisms per gram of soil is in the billion. So the amount we're putting out there is really quite small. So you're bringing together all these considerations and sort of saying, so is there an unacceptable risk? Is there an unacceptably high level of microorganism going out there that I need to, to look at? So the applicants should be providing good information on how much they're applying, where it's going, what happens to it, and that will mostly be done by reasoned cases rather than um, empirical evidence. So I use this as a, frame, as a framework for proceeding. Um, and if we look at that FAO guideline, they've, they've sort of broken it down and it's, they've got two slides that are related to this. So for if you're an indigenous species, most countries have the rule that you can have a release of an indigenous species. So the species must have occurred somewhere in the country. Um, sometimes there's lots of evidence of, of that because it's been a topic of research usually. And other times there's not so much evidence be just because nobody's done the research. So what the choice then is, is to go and look for the research papers to say, does this species occur in that country? Or sometimes some a company might go out and look for it and say, look, we did a survey and we found that you actually have it here, it's just no one's ever researched it before. So we're talking now about indigenous species. So there's various categories that allow you to take a different approach. So you've got a microorganism that's been applied at similar or below levels that commonly occur in the natural environment, and there's no secondary compounds. Then you're gonna see a very short rationale uh, for the waiver of data on the effects in the environment, but also the effects on non-targets. There will be you can argue that there will be no effects if, if you're not significantly adding to um, the microorganism population. Then you can think about you've got, um, you're applying things that are significantly above what you'd have in the natural environment, but no secondary compounds. What do you do then? Um, then you want to provide information about what happens to the microorganism. This is the biology and ecology. Will it establish? Will it grow? Will it persist? And what we usually find is that the microorganisms are degraded and break down by natural biotic and abiotic process. You know, UV light kills them, desiccation kills them. And then there's other organisms which will um, use them as a food source and so that they'll slowly degrade. Um, <clears throat> and as an applicant, you want to think about, well, how do I demonstrate the slowly degrading? So a very simple way could be you've taken some soil, you put your microorganism in it, and if it's an insect pathogen, you add an insect and you see when that insect doesn't die, and that gives you an indication of how quickly the microorganism is no longer effective. So there's some quite sort of simple studies you can do, but as a, an applicant, you need to think carefully about it. And as an evaluator, you'll, you'll see that kind of evidence put forward to support a reasoned case. Um, then there's the other category that you're applying things to similar or to below background levels, and there are other secondary compounds. Um, in this case, then you need to understand perhaps what's the toxicity of those secondary compounds um, and whether those secondary compounds could have effect against your non-target organisms. And then if we work through this a little bit further, You've also got, um, again, applying microorganisms significantly above natural levels and relevant secondary compounds. And this is a situation where you start to see 
you'd need a lot more studies there to show that um, you're not having a, having a significant effect. And then you start to be um, thinking about what effects if that you'll have on the, the non-target. So in all of this, if there's no microorganisms above background levels, then if there's no toxicity it, and you don't have a concern for the soil, it's not all air or water, you can't then have an effect against your non-targets. So this argument about what happens in the environment leads you on to understanding as to what you need to do for your non-target organisms. Um, and then you've got this sort of category where there is no information and there's relevant compound. Now you have to do a lot more work as an applicant and as an evaluator, you expect to see a lot more information there. Um, so if I've, I've sort of summarized what is quite complex, but hopefully quite logical. It's this tiered approach of sort of saying, and starting with, you know, can I start at this easier level that is similar to backgrounds, no secondary compounds, and you slowly work your way through and say, what complexity am I at here? What am I dealing with? And then applicants think in that way and evaluators sort of should, should have the evidence. So basically the more complex you become, the more evidence that you need to present. And I just want to pause a little bit there to see if there's any relevant questions come in. Yeah, thanks Roma. And thanks for that, that, um, that start as well. It's actually quite nicely, I think, that, as you say, going sort of simple to more complex and it's really nicely set out. We, we have a question here. What if the nature of the microorganism changes over time? That is a mutual interaction with plants into a pathogenic interaction or saprotroph into pathogenic. How would the fate and behavior of the microorganism be assessed? Well, so as, uh, if you've developed a biocontrol agent, you're very unlikely to buy to develop a biocontrol agent that does that because it stops being a biocontrol agent. Um, and if we think of this in terms of evolutionary terms, what you're describing is exceedingly unlikely to happen. It's that's why you have to understand the biology and ecology to know that. So that information should be in the biology and ecology part of the dossier. And if you have a microorganism that has a propensity to do that, I would suggest it's not something you should be developing as a biocontrol agent because it stops being valuable as a biocontrol agent. But I also say these microorganisms we're working with um, have been under a lot of evolutionary pressure for a very long time and have become what they are. They, the ability to change is not such a, a ready ability to become an, a pathogen, say a pathogen of insects, is an incredibly complex series of processes. Um, and and it's, there's multiple things going on, so we don't really expect it to change. Okay, great. A uh, couple of other questions. Um, the FAO toolkit, I mean, I know you, I did say, I did hear you say, be patient, <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Do you have any idea around how long that will be? For the microorganisms, yeah. I'm afraid to say that is as quickly as I get the work finished. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm doing that at the moment. Um, and not FAO as well, it's me who's been a bit slow. I need to get that finished. So um, yeah, that's what I'm Okay, I'm, so I'm maybe, maybe within the next, next six months as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so that gives us a yeah, bit yeah. of a time zone. And another yeah. question here. I mean, you said here that... Um, certain types of microorganisms could be considered for reduced data requirements. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I guess the question here is, would this be written as a requirement, however? Like, do regulators have the choice to actually yes. decide that they can do uh, reduced data requirements, or would that have to be written in the, in the sort of rules that they can choose at an individual level? Yeah, so the, this, if, if you're working with this FAO guidance, um, WHO FAO guidance for microbials, uh, botanicals and semio chemicals, um, this is a is advice that's in that document and is, is considered advice. And that document was developed in consultation with regulators globally, um, not just in sort of Western Europe, but across the whole world to think about how to do it because there's a lot of microorganisms we're using biocontrol that everybody knows a lot of information about. Yeah. And we just work through and say, are there, are there real risks from these? Where do the risks lie? And as a group, we worked that through and thought, well, actually there's certain microorganisms where the risk is much, much lower. Um, so I'd really encourage evaluators to look at that and say, can they take that approach? Um, but to take that approach, you have to have good information on the identity, good information on the biology, ecology. Um, 
but it, it is a it's a realistic and well considered approach. And some of the background for being able to take that approach is we looked across at dossiers that had been developed in other parts of the world mm -hmm. and looked at what the endpoints were for certain types of microbes, like a trichoderma or a metarosium or bovaria. And what we found was that if the depending on the production process, if there's no secondary compounds present, there actually was no adverse results in any of the studies that had ever been done. And that says, so we have the evidence to say this is a really reasonable way, approach to take and, and to really encourage evaluators to look at that and to simplify the process because then we can move, the, the regulation really isn't a barrier and we can move on to delivering products to farmers. But it's, it's not compromising safety, it's using the evidence we have to make those good decisions. Great, thanks, Rhonda. And I, I'd be keen to hear from anyone in the room if you d don't be shy, but if you're if you actually have experience in that particular aspect, I'd love to hear your thoughts and your experiences around um, reduced data requirements and and what you're doing in country, or your experience if you're an applicant as well would be interesting. So thanks, Rhonda. Okay, all right, I'll I'll move on now. So um, that all that information was about indigenous species now we're talking about non-indigenous now if something's non-indigenous it does represent a high risk um, to the environment and to non-target organisms and in some countries there's just an absolute no you can't have a release and in other situations um, that you can have a release but you have to provide an awful lot more information you have to understand really understand its biology and ecology um, because the risks do go up as a non-indigenous species and thinking about what happens when they introduce a non-indigenous species so technically it's possible to register a non-indigenous species I've actually never seen that that done because people one because most of biocontrol agents are so incredibly common um, but two because the amount of work that would be needed to do that starts to make the cost of developing the dossier prohibitive versus the market size for having a non-indigenous species. Um, and then the other thing to think about is for environmental fate and behaviour is that the insect pathogenic microbial control agents are really a, a, a special category because they're only affecting insects. But what you do need to think about is will this microorganism affect bees and, and how should it affect bees? And so for a uh, insect pathogenic microorganisms, you may want to do a little bit more thinking through about bees. That doesn't mean to say you need to do more studies, but as an evaluate, uh, applicant and evaluator, you need to think carefully um, what happens with bees. And what I often see in a dossier is um, you get advice on a label which says don't apply whilst be bees are actively pollinating, but that only comes as a result of seeing that your microorganism actually did and was pathogenic to the bees. Um, as I say, a lot of these pathogenic organisms are quite specific in their target host. So just because you're insect pathogenic doesn't mean you will be pathogenic to bees as well. But I do think it's something that you probably need to just check you, as an evaluator. You might well see a study put, put into the dossier because the applicant just wants to be thoughtful. But again, don't assume because you're an insect pathogen you will kill bees, but you need to think that through. So talking about the non-target organisms, so as we've sort of led into, you can only have an effect against a non-target organism if you're in that environmental compartment. So if you're not in the water, there's no point testing non-target organisms in water because nothing's going to happen. If you're not in the air, there's no point testing non-target organisms in the air. So again, that really leaves you thinking about non-target organisms that are going to be in the soil environment. And then what you have to think through is, is, is what are the non-target organisms that you want to, want to test against? So what an applicant will do is going through that decision tree will sort of look at, am I putting an amount of microorganism that's significantly above existing background levels? If the answer to that is yes, then you have to think, okay, in that environment, which microorganisms might be more effective? So you might think about, you, you may not want to test a lace wing, which is on the foliage, if you're putting it into the soil, for example, but you do maybe need to think about things like aliacara or a soil invertebrate that's in the soil. One thing you certainly do not need to do is test earthworms because an earthworm would not survive in the soil for a long periods of time if it couldn't stand being exposed to microorganisms. So really earthworms are out of there. It's just maybe thinking about some of the um, non-target invertebrates that you might want to think about. Now, we're talking about non-target organisms. If we go through and think about fish, 
you don't need to do those because you haven't got the microorganisms in the water. Then you think about birds. Um, if if the microorganism is not pathogenic to birds, it doesn't matter that the birds are exposed to it because it won't have an effect on them at, at all. And some of the arguments you might see for birds is, for example, um, the temperature growth profile of the microorganism. So birds have quite high body temperature. So if the microorganism won't um, grow at that higher body temperature that birds have, then it can't be pathogenic to the birds. You have to think a little bit if there's a secondary metabolite there, would it have an effect on the birds? And sometimes you see dossier where there's tests on birds. But again, I don't encourage you to go and do the testing. It needs to be thought through and think, do I have an exposure to birds that is at much higher than background levels, or do I have a secondary compound there um, that thinks that I do need to test against, against birds? And I sometimes hear people saying, but what happens if a bird eats an insect that's got that been infected by the microorganism? Well, one, it, um, my, insects are constantly being infected by microorganisms. There's two things. Some birds just completely avoid an infected insect because it's presumed it doesn't taste very nice. So they don't eat a, an insect which is stuffed full of a microorganism. Um, and the other thing is some birds do that because they don't care, which means that they have an immune system that's not affected by it. So again, it's just thinking logically about existing exposure and what's gonna happen. So that's the, the birds. Um, so then we're left, as I said, with, with sort of thinking about the, micro, the organisms that you might find in the soil environment, sort of the things like the, the soil mites, um, and are they likely to be e exposed and what does that look like? So what you can often see in the non-target organism part of the dossier, the ecotox part of the dossier, is you'll have a patchwork of information which will be recent cases, some of it will be studies, some of it will be cross-referencing back to the biological properties. Some of it will say, well, look, by my, from my environmental consideration, I've not got enough microorganisms to be above background levels. I don't have secondary compounds, so I haven't got exposure, so I don't need to do the study. So what you'll see in this ecotop section of the is a mix of all those pieces of information. And again, thinking if you've got an insect pathogenic microorganism, just a little bit more attention on those and, and whether there would be exposure to bees and what that looks like. And it, again, going back to that list of, you know, whether you've got a, a microorganism above background levels, below background levels, with or without secondary tablets and work out where you are on that, that chart and then what, what you need to do in that chart. So it's a very, it has to be a very thoughtful, reasoned scientific process to, to develop the dossier and to evaluate the dossier. Um, if you do actually have to do any testing, um, there are some, some microbial test guidelines. I met, raised, mentioned these before for human health. Um, they're the same series 885 that's been developed by the um, US Environmental Protection Agency Department for Biopesticides. Um, they're really quite old, but they're, 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 re, they're the best examples we have. Um, and you have a series of test guidelines for what to do in the environment. And that would be, if you've done that calculation for what should be the background levels, if you're significantly above background levels and it's not gonna degrade, okay, what do I now test? And then there's also a series of um, guidelines and methodologies that you can use for non-target or organism testing. But again, I, I really don't encourage people to do any animal testing without good reason. So you need to be very thoughtful about whether you go ahead and do animal testing. And a lot of them, in my experience, a lot of the dossiers for microorganisms, you're able to make a reasoned case. So that's where I was going to talk about for microorganisms. And before I move on, just let's pick up any sort of microorganism based um, questions that have come through. Is there any questions there, Alison? No, not at this point, um, Roma, but um, okay. I, I would carry on and, and we'll have some questions for you ready for the, for the next session. Okay, all right. So what I'm going to, uh, that's what, where I was going to sort of um, finish up for microorganisms. I'm going to now talk about botanicals, which are a little bit more tricksy and complicated. So again, when we start to think about botanicals, those first parts of the dossier about the identity and its physical properties are really important. And, and I advise any applicant to design those well and for evaluators to really read those. Um, and when you're developing those, thinking about providing information that will help evaluators for the fate and behavior environment and effects on non-targets part of the dossier. So just a reminder what we're talking about by botanicals and extracts, these are substances that have come from plants um, and there may be a whole series of 
lots of different plants used and there may be a whole different ways of the plants are grown, manufactured and processed. Um, and then you have lots of different, um, it's a very complex group with lots of different types of botanicals in it. And we to, to help with our thinking, we're trying to divide them in sort of these three groups. There's a group where um, no components of, of concern, components where you may have, uh, have components of concern, but you know what they are, and others where you really don't know what they are. And so those three different approaches would also affect what you have to do um, when you think about um, EFATE and think about ecotox. So thinking about um, what botanicals are, so botanical active substance can, can really crude extract or something very, very refined. So I know some things which have got multiple peaks of different compounds in there, all the way through to something that maybe almost 95% purity on one, one compound. And as an evaluator, you're gonna get all of those different parts. The real concern is whether there's a component of toxicological concern in there or not. And you're looking for the applicant to have demonstrated that there isn't something of toxicological concern, or if there is, they know what it is and they're going to be able to understand what happens to it. But there's no two ways about it. Botanicals are complex um, and there's some really smart thinking needed to, to work out how to address this properly. And, uh, but this FAO guideline, um, there's advice in there to try and help this process. Um, so the critical aspects, because these are mixtures, is the quality of the material, um, the correct identification, the manufacturing process, the really good definition of the active substance, consideration of whether there's residues and efficacy. The reason why environmental fate and ecotox is not on that list is again because if you're taking something from a plant that's already found in nature, which has a lot of exposure already, there may be um, we have a lot of information, we know that it isn't um, of concern for the environment. And the other thing that we'd encourage instead of doing new testing is to look at whether there's information in parallel regulation or parallel advice it can use. So for example, is there an ADI, is there an adult daily intake value set with, by FAO that you can say, someone can calculate and say, look, when I release it, I'm gonna be below that level. So. I don't have a concern and just thinking that through that's for human health but thinking that through for an environment as, as well but remembering yet yeah, botanicals do come from plants that are found out there but also remembering that plants are really great at producing toxic substances so just because it's from a plant don't assume it's non-toxic as an applicant you have to demonstrate that it's not toxic and demonstrate why you could take a, a different approach. But things that help in the environment is again, thinking about that soil, air and water exposure, is if you understand a little bit about the biology of what happens to this botanical. So things that are particularly useful is understanding the breakdown pathways for, the, for that botanical substance and thinking in the way that they can decompose and thinking about that in terms of soil, air and water again, is what do, does UV light break them down? Are they volatilized very easily? Um, are they so diluted in water that they, they're at a level where they, they would be toxicologically relevant? In, those, in the soil, are they, a lot of things in the soil are broken down again by abiotic and biotic factors. So they're broken down by the action of other microorganisms. So the soil is rich in microorganisms that break down volatile organic compounds and a lot of the botanicals are volatile organic compounds. So there's a lot of information in the literature to give you the basis and justification for understanding that actually this is a really common compound. Nature's used to dealing with it and here's the evidence to show that that's, that's what's happened. So again encouraging you to look at the literature and think about this as good scientists and think about very logically the approach that we can take. Um, there are exceptions. If you've got something you don't know what it is and you do know that you have toxicity, um, then you've got to think about, can I synthesize it and radio label it? To be honest, it's almost impossible to do this. So if you've got something that is of concern, I've, I'd encourage applicants to think really seriously about whether you want to take it forward because the moment you have to try and synthesize and radio label it, your costs are going to go massively high. And do you have a market for something that is going to be of ecological or environmental ecotoxological concern? Um, so 
It's not to say that they aren't toxic, but to say that applicants are deliberately and companies are deliberately developing active substances that don't have those characteristics because they're trying to provide to growers substances which um, don't cause unacceptable environmental or ecotox harm. But that's not to say that they can't do that. It's to say that companies are developing something that doesn't have that. And then it beholds the company must provide the evidence to justify what they're saying. Um, so in terms of thinking about what happens in the environment and understanding, what you're looking at is, is how much is out there already and how it breaks down. And then of course, this affects your ecotoxological arguments. So the risk can be considered acceptable when the estimated exposure level as a result of the application are lower similar to natural background levels. And therefore you can't have an unacceptable effect on non-target organism because you're not putting anything out there that the they might not already be exposed to, and then you can avoid having to do unnecessary animal testing. Um, also to think about the diversity and complexity of botanicals, um, so that the non-target organisms are potentially affected very substantially, and you have to be very thoughtful again about thinking of which of the non-target organisms are going to be affected. It may not you know, it may not be the daphne or the fish or the birds, but it might be something else. And the applicant, and you need to really think this through and think how you, how you do this um, and the approach that you're going to take for this. And then if you do have a component of concern and ecotoxological data, uh, data is necessary, think about this in terms of each of the environmental compartments and think about what studies you do for Daphne, what studies you uh, in the fish, so aquatics, um, think about the aquatic plants, the aquatic invertebrates and the aquatic uh, larger organisms and then again thinking about that for birds, what the exposure would be. Um, the met there's some method, there's a Methods that I um, said for the microorganisms might give some clues about how to do the testing because the standard chemical methods will be difficult to follow because you've got a complex mixture. So often what you have to do is adapt, adapt the protocol. And again, it's being really thoughtful working with the contract research lab to work out the best way to, to test the method. So sometimes, so some of these um, botanical substances, if they're monoterpenes, which are really, really common in plants, they're highly volatile. So you have to think about, well, how do I test something that's highly volatile? Um, so if you're thinking about something like Daphne, um, it, it, because it's highly volatile, it's going to volatilize. Some things I work with volatilize out of the water um, surface in 15 minutes. And you think, well, is there any point doing a Daphne test if I know it volatilizes in 15 minutes? So it's matching up the characteristics of the botanical with the which which target organism you test. And think, but it may be more relevant if I um, if, if I've got longer persistence in water, say it takes a few hours before it, it, it breaks down or dissipates. What do I test then? And then you think, okay, maybe I do need to test some Daphne, I do need to think about aquatic plants, I do need to think about fish, just to confirm that I don't have um, an adverse effect on those. Um, and then thinking about the air environment and think is, uh, is this botanical, is the amount of botanical I'm putting out there going to be significantly higher than you get from the plants anyway? So you think about a forest, a forest, a forest is producing terpenes all the time at really high levels. And a lot of um, birds are already exposed to it without any adverse effects. So again, thinking about what's happening in nature. Um, and then thinking about, again, in the soil, what effect am I going to have when I put these botanicals in the soil? And which organisms in the soil do I need to think about? But you do have this group that I'm saying this, this group three. This, so these are substances which they do have components of concern. The applicant still wants to proceed because they think there's a good market. Um, and they want to sort of show that, yes, there are components of concern, but these components of concern are not having an adverse effect on non-target organisms. And then in principle, you're going to have a much fuller um, data package. There'll be much more studies in there. But again, because your botanicals, you're having to think about how those study guidelines are adapted for these complex botanicals. Um, you can't just go in and do the studies without adaptation usually. You have to think it through and work closely with the CRO. And you, then as an applicant, you need to explain to the evaluator what you've done so it's really clear to them to help them. So really always explain your thinking and your logic and be very logical. I always think it's about telling a story. 
and just working our way through really logically and making sure you explain that story really well as to what you've done so that the evaluator who's no nowhere near as familiar as the applicant is so you can explain to the evaluator really clearly what you did why you did it and what the outcome of that was and therefore what can you conclude from that so that's sort of where i was on botanicals i wanted to pause again Great, Rama, and I, I sorry I interrupted you then, so I was just about to say, you've got a few questions. I, okay. I, I also like that kind of, um, I guess, that guidance of trying to tell a story, really, because if you're working on this product, you obviously know it better than, than anyone else, almost. So you're the best place there to sort of tell a story and to lead people through to a desired result. A couple of questions here. Firstly, just for, is there a checklist or something that an easy checklist for risk assessment for ecotoxicology that people can kind of check through and tick. Yeah, it's, it's not quite a checklist, but I, again, um, have a look at that WHO FAO guideline, and it's in that it sort of says what as an applicant, what things you should be thinking about, and what are the more critical things, and then as an evaluator, what are the things that you're kind of looking for. It's very hard to have just a really strict checklist because these are such a complex group of um, substances mm -hmm. and you know you'd end up with a very um, complicated tree and saying do this for this one this for this one this for yep. this. so it gives them general principles to guide you through the process of, of what to do um, but in a way as an applicant you're kind of you should be making it easy and understandable for the evaluators so that they can look at that data and say okay this makes absolute sense based on biology and ecology why they've done this and why they've said this and why this is concluded and i agree with it or disagree with that conclusion yeah so not a checklist but certainly good guidance to walk you through okay great thanks uh, a, a couple of other questions here is how is it possible to have a substantial background concentration of botanicals in the environment question mark mm -hmm. contrary to microorganisms it seems unlikely to have a certain existing level in the environment uh -huh. oh, but there is <laughs> so i just gave the example um it, it, it forestry uh, if you walk through a pine forest and you smell that lovely smell of pine those are terpenes, those are the volatiles, they're all there all the time, so they are producing them and putting them into the air, so there's a background level of, of the amount of terpenes. Um, and it's the same, you know, when a plant's grown, it produces things out of its roots, and there's existing um, substances produced in the root area. And when those plants die and break down and go into the soil, nature we, we aren't sort of having we don't have an accumulation of plants they're broken down what are they broken down by they're broken down a whole series of, of abiotic and biotic, biotic factors and those those abiotic and biotic factors are working on these botanicals that are applied as well so it's um there's absolutely do have background levels for these substances um and there's, there's information in the literature about what these background levels are um, so, and they're really well studied. I mean, the difficulty comes if you're working with a plant, which is less well known. So we know lots about neem, and there's lots of people done research on it. But perhaps you might be working with a less well known plant. Um, and then when you're working with something that's less well known, it is harder, and you will have to produce more data specific to your botanical. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Another question here. I'm interested in matrine and oxymetrine. I've heard there's an issue on it in EU regulation. Is it true? Any updates on whether it controls fall armyworm? Okay. Yeah, there are some real safety issues in matrine. It's not something that you perhaps really want to proceed with. Um, and as you say, there is information and evidence around by considerations by other regulatory authorities which outline exactly what those issues are. And I think it's something that it's, I think there's other botanicals around that can be developed rather than the tree. Um, so really think about that. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier about um, accessing information that has been already um, decided by other regulatory authorities. Um, so if I was an evaluator, and I was had a dossier for metrine, I would expect there to be consideration of what other regulatory authorities have done. That's how we learn. We learn from our, our peers around us and what good quality work and say, yeah, it's absolutely true. There is an issue with metrine. 
Great, thank you for that. And that's a good point too, is learning from what other regulatory sort of systems are doing and what decisions they've made and kind of learning what they've looked at. So that's an excellent point as well, Roma. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next uh, next section. Yeah, okay, so um, the, the next section is gonna be senior chemicals. And, and just to say, you know, I'm working through this quite quickly and that's because we want to have a nice discussion at the end as well. Okay. So we've um, so now thinking again about the fate and behaviour in the environment and effects of non-target organisms for senior chemicals. Now this is kind of really interesting for senior chemicals. So again, got to think about the identity and the physical properties. But we have some really nice features of senior chemicals. So the main ones that are used um, in plant protection at the moment are the straight chain lepidoptin pheromones. Um, these are mating disrupting pheromones, and what the main characteristic of most of the pheromones and senior chemicals we work with is they're not killing something. They're changing the behavior of something. So this makes them really different when we think about this in terms of environmental fate and in terms of ecotoxicology. So one of the things to think about is insects are communicating all the time. You know, male moths are trying to find field net moths all the time. And how do they do that? They do that because a female moth produces a pheromone. So the environment is stuffed full of pheromones. We have no idea because we don't pick up on the signals. We can't smell them. But if you're a moth, it's probably quite exciting. So for senior chemicals, um, the main way that they use, or one of the main ways is mating disruption. And this is the pheromone is released um, that mimics the female hormone, female pheromone and the males can't find the females then you break the life cycle because they can't mate you can't get the next life cycle there's also some which are lure and kill where the pheromones released and um, the idea is to attract the um, females to a certain point and then they get they're killed by some means it could be killed by another by a control agent it could be killed by um and getting stuck to something and then this all overlaps with the mass trapping concept where again you're pulling the insect in and sometimes for mass trapping you're using a chiromone which is a food it stimulates the smell of food and attracts the insects in because it, they think it's food and then they get stuck there in water or on traps or something so remembering with the interesting part about senior chemicals is they're not killing anything the other part about senior chemicals as well as not having a top toxic action they're really target specific so they have all of the effect only against their target species so that starts you thinking and saying well okay so for what non-target organisms would i need to look at and the answer probably is none because all they work at that they have an effect on is the target but what you probably want to confirm is how target specific they are and you would be expecting to have evidence in the dossier of exactly how target specific the senior chemical is and that's really easy to do because usually you only have members of the same species that respond to the smell and of course as i said earlier that the the senior chemicals are already out there the insects are communicating with each other all the time so they're already there it's just we can't detect them we don't know they're there the other part about senior chemicals is they're used at very low rates. They're often used at micrograms per hectare. They're used at very, very tiny amounts. So you're not putting you know, litres or kilograms per hectare out there. It's very small amounts. They also, because they are in the air, they move in the air very rapidly and they degrade uh, in the environment. And again, we expect that to do. So for an insect, if it's producing a pheromone, they don't want to produce a pheromone that stays around forever because then the air gets saturated and the males can't find them. So it's kind of like they, they produce something that is in the air for a while and then breaks down and they produce it again. So it's like if you go into, if you're working somewhere that's, um, you know, in a kitchen which has a beautiful smell, after a while you can't smell it anymore because you've become in, sort of newer to it. So it's the same with the insects. So to get over that, they, they have a release, breakdown, release, breakdown. So we know that senior chemicals do dissipate and degrade rapidly in the environment. And of course, the semen chemicals really pose very little risk to human health and health and the environment as a consequence. Mainly don't have a residue. Um, but as we talked about, the efficacy is, is harder. So, um, so this makes them different from chemicals, but it also makes them sort of quite different uh, in terms of environmental and um, non-target risk assessment. So the underlying principle for senior chemicals is looking at the amount of senior chemical that uh, you're, as an applicant that you're putting out there. So, you know, you put the senior chemicals into little sort of PVC containers, which are spread around the crop. 
So you look at how much does that contribute to what goes into the air compared to what's there already. I haven't put the calculation into this presentation, but you will find that calculation in the WHO guidelines. Um, but there's a really clear calculation you can do for what is known for the, or what can be estimated for the existing background level. And then as an applicant, you say, okay, I'm contributing this much, I'm at background levels. And pretty much all the time, you're, you're at background levels. So what you're doing then is you're always looking at the amount that's released by the the product that's put out in the field relative to background levels and what that natural exposure is. Um, and remembering a lot of these dispensers are also retrieved. So they're only there for a short period in, in the crop when the pest is active. So they're not there for a long period of time. And again, this affects the environmental exposure and who's it, what's exposed to it. So um, you need to take that into consideration. Now, if you have a pheromone that is formulated in a sprayable formulation, that calculation is going to ch change. You sort of roughly take the same principle, but there's every likelihood that you might have a higher exposure and you then just need to think about it. But remembering that semi chemicals are so specific, they only affect members of the same species. So in terms of environmental fate, in terms of non-target organisms, they're not gonna have an effect against other organisms that are out there. And this is the principle of the approach that's taken to an ecotoxicology part of the dossier, is when the um, exposure to the non is by the vapour phase only, and you are not expecting um, further information to be needed. And so you'll often see in a, the applicant should have prepared and valid to see is a recent case for the non-provisional of data. Now, as I say, for a sprayable one, you need to have some to see some additional argumentation in there. And the other thing to think about um, with these um, semi-chemicals is it may be possible to use data that's derived from other regulatory mechanisms that have been using the same substances. So, so for some of these, these, these pheromones may be used in other areas for different purposes. Um, so it's always worth doing the research to find out, again, as much background information, where else they use, and and can you use some of that already available evidence um, to, to, to add your argument? I, I just should emphasize here is, is you can't use data that's protected by somebody else. You've got to only use data that's available in the public domain. So that was really where I got to with semi chemicals. I'm just uh, going to take a pause there um, about semi chemicals, um, whether anybody's got any questions, because it's really peculiar that for environmental faith and ecotox, you, you really don't have much to do for semi chemical. And I'm not sure um, whether uh, people listening today agree with what I'm saying or the approach that I've proposed. There's no questions uh, as yet, Roma, but maybe if people could put like a, uh, you're, getting a you're getting a heart there coming up, but <laughs> people could also- I disagree. <laughs> yeah, put, no, put a thumbs up if you're working on semi chemicals. Is anyone working on semi chemicals? Have they seen a dossier? Uh, that would be really interesting because I am not sure how many in the room yeah. actually are. If you are, just put a thumbs up from the reactions. Okay. So, so maybe it's a split well, question. One. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So one person has worked on Good. Good. You've got another um, question though, Roma. Okay. No. Have you got Have you got another? Oh, you're going to ask. Yeah, I was going. Yes, I was going to ask um, the flip side, um, because what I've been saying about environmental fate and ecotoxicology for semi chemicals is really quite different what we might expect for semi chemical is um, maybe sort of we could have thumbs up if people sort of think it's logical what I've been at laying out and thumbs down if people think no, that we, we think we need other work. So maybe people could react, um, both um, applicants and evaluators, as to whether it's logical what we what I'm proposing for assessing environmental fate and ecotox. So perhaps some reactions. You should be able to find the little um, thumbs up and down in your. So I think um, there's only a thumbs box. up. Oh, is there? No <laughs> we're, thumbs we're, down. Only okay. a, we're only a positive a positive group here. <laughs> So does that so, mean no one's replying that you all think I'm wrong? <laughs> so put your thumbs up if you think this is making sense, if it oh, seems cute. logical, and um, you'll see that down at the reactions 
there we go we're getting some reactions now so you'll see that on the bottom of your uh, screen if you just put your cursor over it you'll see the black menu come up you're getting quite a lot of reactions there so that's great okay Good, good. Okay, so it's, it's, it's making some logical sense. I'm glad to hear that. I'd hate for it to be um, to, to be no logic in it. Good, good. And I think what I'm trying to say and, and, and what I've been trying to say across the whole of these, these series of um, sessions is that we have to think as good scientists and we, we have to be good scientists and we need to think logically, thinking about what the substance is um, and thinking what its toxicity is or, or is not and then thinking okay so based on that how do, how do I evaluate it and just telling that very very good story um, on, on what to do so just moving on then you know one of the things I said at the beginning was that um, the, the, the regulate there's lots of innovation going out there and we know that we want to implement integrated pest management and we know we need a lot of products to do that so what we don't want is that regulation is, is a barrier. We want regulation to protect humans. We want the regulators to protect the environment, but it shouldn't be an, a necessarily high barrier. So what can we do um, to, to make sure that regulatory is working well? So I think you can have a dedicated um, scheme for bioprotectants and you have people who are skilled in the technologies to understand it well. Well, I think we also have expert evaluators. So the applicants need to be good at what they're doing, but the evaluators also need to be good at what they're doing. They need to understand the, the, the scheme. So the dedicated bioprotective scheme is something that governments can do and set up to encourage the, through, the pull through of these technologies. And as we can see from the people who are attending these sessions, we know that there's people out there who want to gain expertise and become these expert evaluators. I think then it's really important to have a clear process, to have a clear process from right from the beginning all the way through. And for me, regulation works really well when there's a good partnership between the applicant and the evaluator. That's not so the applicant can influence the evaluator, it's so the applicant can explain well what their technology is and allow, give the, the evaluator the sufficient evidence to make their good decisions. Um, and also thinking, there's a lot of time as to say you don't need to provide data when. Um, but that doesn't mean the applicant can't explain it, but it's a really good principle so that then the evaluator is only given the information they need to allow them to make a good decision. They're not swamped with data, which they have to read and have to evaluate, but doesn't help them make a good decision. So it's been really thoughtful about what the right pieces of information to provide are. And this trusted and engaged partnership. So to, as an applicant, you want your product to be approved. And as an evaluator, you want the products to be approved because you want to get solutions to pharma. So we should trust everybody. We should trust um, applicants, we should trust evaluators, and we should trust our colleagues in other, within our departments, within our countries and in other countries and trust the evaluations made in by other authorities. It can often save us an awful lot of work. Um, and if we're working to the same standards, this really, really helps that you have this harmonization where everybody's trying to work to the same standards. And, and I know I'm sort of based what I've done on the WHO FAO guideline. And that's because that's, a, that's an example of, of a harmonized standard that we could all work to. And it was developed very thoughtfully with a wide group of people and taking sort of quite deep experience um, that had been learned. And then sharing of data that we don't need to always produce new data, that you can share data with each, with each other, that's um, between authorities. And then I think if, the, if governments can instigate um, innovation enabling policies, um, which are supporting the regulators, they're supporting the regulators with um, allowing them to gain the expertise, supporting the regulators with enough staff, and supporting the regulators by funding them well um, and not having fees that are too high for the applicants, all of these things that governments can do to, to enable that innovation to come forward. And you, we can see in countries like Brazil where they, this happens, that they have far more biocontrol products than everybody else in the world. But what I don't underestimate is that this, all these biopesticides, whether they are microbial, botanical or semi-chemical, it's much, much more complex. And this is what makes them harder. So your dossier may have less paper. So if I put together a dossier for a, of a microorganism, it may be, I have a sort of meter high stack of paper, um, which can 
if it was a chemical, you'd have 20 meters high. So it's a lot less paper, but it's very knowledge intense and it's a different type of knowledge. So it's knowledge and information about soil ecology, plant ecology, the landscape, the microbials, genetics. It's all of these other diff different disciplines that need to come together. And this is what makes the dossiers harder just to assess because you've got all these other parts. But that's what F WHO FAO tried to do to simplify. Um, all of this knowledge into a way that can be is pragmatic for ap applicants and for evaluators. And yes, we still do, do need some knowledge of chemistry. Um, we're, we're not moving to world without chemistry. So that's more or less finished for today's presentation. But what I wanted to do is, is go through some of the questions that have been raised through the sessions and maybe take some time to, to look at these but also then to um, take some time to raise questions from today. So I think I'd first start with the questions from today, Alison, um, if anything else has come through and if not, then I'll move through to um, thinking about questions that have been raised through this series. And if people can start to think um, as put into the chat, any other questions they have. Thanks, Roma. Yes, I'm just going to encourage everyone, put, put your questions and your burning questions that you want to ask um, Roma while you have her here. Anything uh, is acceptable. There's no silly or stupid questions here. Uh, probably your question is somebody else is thinking the same thing or, or wanting this, wanting an answer as well. So please just put it in. Um, it's just it's just great to have a discussion. Really interested in hearing from uh, regulators, but also applicants on those sort of things that help build a really robust system. So it was really nice your list before uh, Roma, where you had the different components that helped build a really, here we go, a successful bioprotectant regulatory sort of system and capacity. So I'd be very interested in hearing um, from you all on any of those aspects where you think you need more help to. So please put in the, um, in the chat where you think you would like more support or if we were to design a specific program for your country or for stakeholders, it could be regulators and applicants in your country because that was one of the important points was can we work more together. Um, if you would like something like that in your country, uh, please please say that in the chat if that's something that you think would be really useful, for example, in Papua New Guinea or whether it's in Singapore or, or, or anywhere in the region. Um, we're really interested to hear if you need some support there to help build capacity and capability. So please share that with us. It, it's not, we're not listing everyone's name against the, the against the feedback. It's it's virtually anonymous and, and we won't we won't be sort of collecting those names against any questions. Um, a couple of questions, uh, Roma, before we move on to those questions that were raised in the survey monkey poll. Um, yep. So if you were, and I think I've asked you this before, but if you were to advise, I guess, uh, regulate, I mean, what would be your top three tips for a regulator when they get a dossier on their desk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so the first thing I would, regardless of whether I'm an ecotox special, environment special, the first thing I'd look at is the, the sections of one and the two. Has the applicant identified this really well? Is it really clear to me what information um, as to what this is? Have they, for my cause, have they sort of put sufficient information on its taxonomy, on its um, secondary compounds? Um, and then thinking in the mode of action, have they described that really well? And the same true for botanicals, have they identified it properly? Do I understand what this substance is that they've extracted and they've found? Um, and then have they put in good information that explains where it came from, how they expect it to work and what it does? Um, and then the same for a single chemical. Is it clear what, it, what, what this is and how it can be used? Because if those parts are done very well, the other parts of the dossier are much, much easier to understand and handle. And it's sort of, you're thinking of that tiered approach, thinking, okay, once I've got my, my foundations right, then it's sort of saying, okay, I don't, I can see why they've said they don't need to um, answer these questions or these questions, but as an applicant, never say not relevant. You must explain why something you don't, it's what it's called is a reasoned case for non-provision of a study. And that reasoned case should be really well done. And so as an evaluator, I'd be looking for that really well done. And that's good evidence. And that evidence isn't just because you say it so as an, as an applicant, it's because there's information in the scientific literature, good quality information, good quality published papers, or you've done good quality studies yourself. 
say you've worked in partnership with a university or a research institute and you've got a really lovely study report which is dated, authored, with all the information in it, you know, what was the aims, what were the methods, what were the results, what were the conclusions, and it's a good quality piece of work. And you're looking for that, let that quality that should be done. So quality doesn't mean quantity, it's quality is the key issue. Great, thanks so, Roma. And I think you yeah. gave a tip there for an app for applicants as well. Mm, <laughs> not yes. to skip any sections and not to put not relevant. Uh, so that that is actually um, very useful as well and we've got a question here um in, in brunei it's really a great area when it comes to regulating biopesticides could you summarize for us the details that we need to consider or review when a company wants to bring in a biopesticide into the country and we actually had a similar question around importing uh, as well in our feedback from the from the monkey survey so it's a there's a good chance good good question thanks Lisa. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question because um, you've, always, you've got two parts, haven't you? You've got somebody who's, who's in the country who's developed a dossier, but you've got somebody who wants to bring it in. Um, and again, the, the WHO guideline actually does address this and it's trying to, what it's trying to help is, is both of those situations. So if an applicant's coming to me, I, I would want to meet the applicant. I'd like to understand what they're doing and I'd want to understand and hear them describe well what the, the, the substance is. Um, I would be looking in that dossier that they've completed all the parts of the dossier. But when you get a chemical, you've got a series of endpoints there and you can just go through and check all those endpoints. And clearly when you're dealing with bioprotectants, you're not going to have endpoints in the same way. So it's much more of a value judgment. So I would be, I would check that um, the company owns the dossier that they're bringing forward. I would check, think where that dossier has come from. Has it come from a country that follows the sort of OECD principles because then it's going to be good quality. If it hasn't come from such a countries such as that, has it come from another country where the, the regulatory process is a good quality regulatory process? And you want all parts of that dossier there. There's nothing missing. It's not just the conclusions. It's actually the dossier. So you can go back and you can cross check um, the conclusions against the evidence that was produced in front of you. It should be complete. There shouldn't be missing parts to it. Um, and this comes down to this trusted engaged partnerships is, is a, as the evaluator that you've met the person who's evaluating it in, and you've learned to trust what they're, they're saying and doing as well. Um, and it might be something you need to think about as sort of uh, thinking, sitting in Brunei thinking, okay, so which countries' dossiers do I think are good quality that we would accept and which countries' dossiers might we have some extra questions about? Um, and to just think through. But I think if you use the WHO FAO guideline for the microbials, botanicals and semi chemicals, there's guidance in there on how to do this and what questions you should ask. Um, it's not going to be a checklist because it's a biopesticide, but there's sufficient guidance to say, OK, this is where you need to be concerned. This is where you don't need to be concerned. Right, thanks, Ryan. I'm not sure if that helps. So come back to me again with no. a question if you think I have <laughs> No, I think that does. I mean, I think it's, I think the important thing here, I mean, I really liked meet the applicant. I actually said meet the application. Sorry, sorry, everyone in the room. But then I put meet the applicant. And I think that's really important because that does build trust as well. When you meet people, you talk to them, you understand if they know what they're talking about. I was interested in check the ownership of the dossier. Is it, what is that because sometimes people put yes. dossiers that are not theirs in? Yes, so sometimes people will rely on <coughs> uh, dossiers that they don't fully own, they don't have. Uh, so you need proof of ownership, it's called a letter of access. Um, okay. So you, you would expect to see a letter of access that can, from the, if a dossier was developed by another company, you mm -hmm. should have an official letter of access to say that the applicant has the rights to access that data. <coughs> and I have seen dossiers being put forward where, that is not the case. Okay. Okay. Good point. Mm. Good point to know. Uh, a question here for semi chemicals. Do the slides look at all the types of pheromones or only specific pheromones? Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about all the pheromones that are released in slow release um, contains. I think I, I mentioned that if you're spraying, spraying 
uh, a semi-chemical that some of the things you need to do a little bit more extra work because of where the pheromone occurs, what its breakdown might be, and you just need to understand a little bit about the formulations and the slow release formulation for a sprayable, and then you've got different exposures, etc. But for something most pheromones are put into um, it, things like it, you know, PVC little tubes or something like that. <clears throat> And, and I was thinking across all pheromones when I was thinking about the um, regulation. That's to say, that doesn't mean that somebody's going to invent something tomorrow that is very different. Um, and it, we've always got invention, but I think the guidelines have got the flexibility to account for something that's, that's newer. Okay, great. Now, I, I asked you this, but in a different way in a previous um, session, but I'm just interested in um, thinking about the sort of what do you think regulators mostly see? What are the most popular sort of applications, do you think? And how is that changing over the last yeah. five years? Yeah, I, I think most people will see, I would say over 50% of what comes through is, is based on a microorganism and maybe even 60 or 70% is, is going to be microorganism. And of the microorganisms, um, the majority of those will be microorganisms active against diseases. Um, and then there's a whole group of will be microorganisms active against insects. I say that so that when most evaluators will have seen the BT dossier, microbial BT dossier, for sure, because BT has been around for such a long time. But if you put aside BT, then I'd say you get a lot that are for disease. So you'll see dossiers for trichoderma, for, um, for um, bacillus amplomyces, these or sort of subtleness, they're really common. And then for the insects, you'll see dossiers for Bavaria, for metarisins coming forward, um, as well as BTs, then you'll see bacular viruses. Those are the most common microorganisms. Then coming after that, probably the most common botanical ones will be for neem. <coughs> um, and then the, the terpenes, so things like limonene, um, terpene itself, uh, granular oil, um, so the essential oils, they're quite commonly coming forward. And then, um, then, then pheromones slightly less. Okay, and the change, sorry, the change over the last five years, what, 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 or what do you see in the next five years? Actually, that's even more interesting in a way. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, yeah, so, so what, what we've seen so far is kind of the easy things. Um, yep. I think we're gonna get the com more complexity coming forward. So we're gonna start to see sort of for the microorganisms, what we're seeing is viable microorganisms with or without secondary compounds. We're start, gonna start to see some dossiers where the microorganism is no longer viable and you're relying on the secondary compounds. And again, that's foreseen in thinking about regulation, but I think we'll see more of those come forward. Um, for then botanicals, we'll see extracts from a wider range of plants coming forward for a wider range of uses. And what I really hope we start to see coming forward is, is dossiers for bioprotectants that are active against nematodes and against weeds, because so far there's very few of those come forward. It's mostly against insects and diseases. And I think we'll see an explosion in the senior chemicals. We're going to see a lot more senior chemicals coming forward because they're just so useful for growers. Yeah. Well, that is actually very interesting, and I think that gives a heads up to all our regulators and our applicants <laughs> who want to be or want to be applicants, uh, maybe to be on the lookout for those things. And as you say, it might be in some ways a little bit more complex um, because they're new. Um, and other ways, I guess, with sort of if we can fast track some of these bioprotectants, um, it could also be less complex if we if we can build the right capacity and capability around good applications and, and good regulation. I've got a question here um, and it starts off not sure if it's a silly question. As, as I said before, there's no silly questions. So, um, but should a uh, microbial biopesticide coming into the country be tested under lab settings to confirm the presence of the microbes listed in its ingredients? Sometimes the labels do not list its mi microbial content in detail, trade secret. For an evaluator, you absolutely got to know what the, the microorganism is. And I noticed the use of the, word, the plural word microorganisms. Um, most dossiers coming through will be single microorganisms. If it's multiple microorganisms, I would want to see a dot, uh, the, the active substance information for each of those microorganisms separately, properly identified, well identified, and then maybe in the product they're combined. Um, you absolutely as an evaluator, how on earth can you follow 
and make a successful evaluation if it's not correctly identified. I think I made that point in the first session. The key part of the dossier is that the identification of the microorganism and it's fully and correctly identified. So, yeah, identify mixtures you can do, but you need to fully identify each of the microorganisms that's in there. You also need to be provides good information on any secondary compounds that could be present. And that comes from looking at the production process as well as um, having evidence for that. Great, thanks Roma. Now we'll just, um, there'll be more questions coming through I'm sure, but if we just move on, we've got a question page everyone and we've, we've collected some questions and there's some very diverse questions and Roma's gonna give her best shot at answering <laughs> some of them. And some of them we'll be answering in other, um, in other forums maybe as well so it may not be this is the right forum but um i can for example say that controlling fall army worm different bio products uh, will, will be in lots of different uh, workshops and you can actually go to our videos page and there's quite a lot there as well for examples but i'm going to hand over to roma and maybe you can choose a few that you that you like or you can move through but i'll, I'll leave it with you over uh, how you want to proceed Okay, I'll see what I can do. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start at the top just to be logical. And um, so what barriers um, law or pharma affect the use of biocontrol? So this is the use at the end. So I think I've already hinted that um, we don't want regulation to inhibit the availability of the biocontrol. So we do have a barrier if we have regulators that are not given the resources, and by that mean time and knowledge, to be able to assess the dossiers. So that will affect what biocontrol can get through to the farmer. And then the difficulty we have with biocontrol is, well, it's a great group of technology, and we're at the beginning of this sort of, um, not quite a revolution, but an evolution away to a more complex way of carrying out crop protection, which is an integrated pest management approach where you're using all the technologies and, and thinking, how do I help the plants grow as well as possible, but manage the disease? We're not trying to kill everything in sight, we're just trying to manage things well. And there's a big, there's an explosion of knowledge and evidence right at the moment. So what makes the use of biocontrol harder is, is that knowledge exchange, is how do you train um, the farmers in this knowledge, how do we train the advisors and the agronomists in this new knowledge and how to use these technologies? And I think some of the responsibility sits with the companies is that companies should be providing the good information with good labels and good advice on how to, when to use something, how to mix it, how to spray it correctly, um, and just really provide a lot of support for the farmers. And when that knowledge chain is incomplete from, the applicant through the regulator to the farmer that's when you have a barrier so it's look at all those aspects and make sure that all those aspects are working well and resourced properly and then you can see biocontrol moving forward um, and the countries where it has moved forward that's what's making it move forward well um then thinking about how many species of microorganisms are used for biocontrol in rice plants very few, <laughs> there's not many. Um, and again, it's interesting that, it, that I think that's not because it's not technically possible, it's because people haven't been looking at it and doing the research. There's no reason why there can't be more microorganism products available for use on pests and diseases in rice. Um, and, you know, if, if I'm, I don't know if someone from um, Erie's here, but we know um, from the fall army work, Alison, that we know that Erie are working on this. And I know other res big research institutes are working on this. So it's just lack of research rather than lack of technical feasibility. And I think we will, if I encourage researchers to start looking at this, I think we will see biocontrol solutions for pests and diseases on rice plants. I know something from rice blast, for example, that's a botanical, um, but it's just been slow to come through. Um, and I do know some um, microorganisms which have, a, have an effect against, say, plant hoppers, but again, they're not being moved through. Because the other thing you need is, is well, not technical knowledge, is you need the companies to, to, to bring them through, to see that there's a marketplace. And if they've got sort of competing against cheap pesticides, what's their incentive to start to, to to invest and bring biocontrols forward. Um, and then there's a question about what mechanisms in place for Papua New Guinea frigates. I don't know the answer to that, but I wonder if there's anybody who's on 
this call who is from Papua New Guinea who could answer that and maybe um, just say what, what, what actions they're taking to, to, to gain knowledge. And I would think the fact that you're here today shows that you're starting to the process of building knowledge to be able to regulate um, biocontrol agents. So maybe somebody wants to put into the chat what, and answer that one, what mechanisms are in place. No, but we'll, we'll come back to, oh, it's a good question and, and we'll find out for that one and I think the next question too is around Papua New Guinea so yeah, um, yeah. Papua New Guinea just if you um, we're going to find out that question for you and, and come back uh, over the next week so thank you for yeah, the question. Yeah I think that's a good one yeah it's a really good question. Um, so then we've got a question about how do we identify the strains of bacteria um, whether we need the same microbe to um, undertake field experiments or different manufacturers. I, I think this comes from um, something we talked about in a previous session. So how to identify the strains of bacteria. So in, in the past, traditionally, we would do this by following a series of tests where we're, we're growing the microorganism and we're following a series of tests on plates and we're subjecting them to, to what's what, what called the Burgess manual approach. That's really kind of not done so much now um, and what we have is we have good molecular techniques for identifying um, strains of bacteria and if you don't have that resource in your country reach out to researchers around the world who are skilled in that particular organism and work with them to help them to get identify the strain is actually really inexpensive to do but what you then do is you follow a technique usually it must be a published technique on how to identify the strain so when a strain gets identified by a molecular technique and is sort of officially registered as or logged as that that technique is published and then you can copy that technique and use that same technique to identify your strain but if you haven't got the resources to that you can send your strains to one of the international tissue culture collection laboratories to do it you could build up a relationship with the um, a, a university team who's expert in that, that particular organism and then they'll have the techniques for identifying it. Um, so you use a molecular technique that is standard for identifying the type strain of that species. And then you look at where your strain sits relative to the other strains of the same species. So you want to use a good molecular technique. The regulation is prescriptive of which method you should use because each microorganism you usually need a slightly different method um, and you follow the method that was used for the original identification. So do we need the same microorganisms to undertake field experiments from different manufacturers? That depends, no. Um, each microorganism strain will perform differently from another strain. So what you're, having to, what you're doing then is looking at which is the best species and strain for my pest or disease. And the starting point for that would be to do some literature research to understand that. And I think I see often that people will sort of say, oh, I'll go and find my own strain. And I just want to say, well, that's a really, really expensive approach to do that. Um, I think the first thing I'd ask is I, if I had a pest or disease that I wanted to get a bio control for, I would test um, what's already available, that's already been developed, is in the manufacturing process for which there's a dossier because that will get to market much more quickly because what you're doing is you're adding a label extension as opposed to starting right from the beginning. Um, so screening, always start with what's commercially available. If none of those work, then perhaps you need to start to think about developing it yourself. But if you're going to develop it yourself, as you'll see from the research series we're doing, that's going to take you 10 plus years before it's in the hands of the farmers. Um, then moving on to the next question. So what key aspects regulators must take into consideration when allowing imports of biocontrols? Um, so I think we've gone into that. We've talked about whether something's indigenous or non-indigenous, and there should be a good um, dossier available that the evaluator and um, the regulators can, uh, can evaluate to see that all the key questions have been asked and that the there's good and sufficient evidence allow them to make that risk assessment decision. And then somebody else sort of quite different, working on parasitoids rather than beneficials. Um, so yeah, so mostly I've been talking about microbes, botanical, semi-chemical, so um, bio, as bioprojectors, but there are beneficials used. Now the regulation for the beneficials is usually around plant import and export rules. And they have rules about what you can do. And most of the work for um, 
beneficials is regulated by those rules. There are a few exceptions. There's so, for example, in Kenya, they have two levels. You have to go through the plant import and export system, and then you have to actually uh, register the, the, the beneficial. But that's ex an exception in most countries. You just have to go through the import and export rules for the, for the beneficial. The full army women, I think as Alison indicated, um, that is something that is, is addressed very fully in the um, Fall Army Worm Project, the ASEAN Fall Army Worm Project. There's a lot of information about what um, biocontrol products are available um, and how they're to be assessed um, and what are the attributes of those substances. So I, I'd really advise you to go and look at those other resources to answer that question. Um, how can we best access the latest updates from biocontrol regulation? Well, being very cheeky by attending these masterclasses. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the, the, I've, or I've indicated to you that the best, the latest updates about biocontrol regulation is that WHO guideline. Um, you can look at what's happening in the US with um, the biopesticide scheme. It's harder in Europe because they don't have a dedicated bio, biocontrol um, regulation page or information so it's harder to find it but some of the trade associations so like the International Biocontrol Manufacturers Association has the latest information and then the sister organization in the US the um, Bioprotection Industry Alliance and they all sit underneath an umbrella called the uh, Bioprotection Global and if you go onto that website you'll find information about these um, producer organizations, and they often have nice up-to-date information about what's happening in biocontrol regulation. Um, then I'm just, uh, next question, I'm working on, I work on biocontrol for a perennial crop. This is a really interesting one. I understand that populations of microorganisms soil are transient with time and environmental conditions. So um, for in what way can biocontrol agents uh, be used in perennial crops? Um, really interesting question, and I think that's that's something that um, we sh will see more and more of when we're looking at how to use microorganisms to manage pests and diseases in perennial crops. But it's not so different from a chemical, it's repeat applications is the, is the answer. So it's understanding the microorganism, understanding the microorganism and when it works and how it works, understanding how long it persists for and looking at the interaction of the pest or disease population with the interaction of the um, substance that you put in. So you're putting your biocontrol agent in when you have your peak, your, the right life stage of your pest and disease target. Um, of course, the pest and disease populations are not so synchronous. So you might have to have two or three applications to reduce the, the population. Um, but there's definitely work going on there. There's information in the literature you can find out about that. But as, as a researcher, I would be looking to understand my pest and disease life cycle and then how I coincide that with the microorganism. And then you'd probably have repeat applications. And then the last question then is about Papua New Guinea, about cocoa. Um, is the cod borer, the, sorry, cocoa pod borer is the main problem. Um, and what's the potential for using biocontrols? Do, I can't answer that now. I'd have to do some work on that. So I think that's one we need to come back on um, and do some research about what biocontrols are available. But a good source of information to get you started would be to go and have a look at the CABI um, website. Um, there's a really good, the CABI have got a really good resource for, for pretty much all the pests around and diseases around the world. And then they have a list of what the biocontrol options as well as the chemical options and what you could use. And they really keep that up to date. So that'd be a really good starting point. Great, so, Alison, that's answered the questions then. Is there anything yeah. else for me? No, uh, yeah, there is, Roma. And thank you very much, because that's quite a big list and uh, some really interesting questions. And we will follow up and we'll also share some of those resources about the latest updates, just some of those um, websites for you to go to, IBMA and, and also in, in the US, for example, um, just so that you've got them in one place. Um, you have got a, another specific question here, and I'm not sure that you know much about leaf miners using semiochemicals. Okay. What could okay, be your I most do. Appropriate approach to control leaf miners using semiochemicals is the question. Oof. Yeah. Okay. So, um, is it, um, is this a leaf miner on tomato? Would it be two to absoluta? If someone could put their thumbs up to say that's maybe what they're thinking about. Um. So, uh, for for semiochemicals. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I think what with a lot of the biocontrols, it's not about 
they're not substitute for chemistry and you can't just use one solution to have the effect that you're having. You're having to layer these in as an IPM. So you would be using a senior chemical as part of a strategic plan. And it's the question is, would you use this, the senior chemical to draw the insects into a trap and you're, you're trapping them out in that way? Um, or are you using the senior chemical to disrupt the mating behavior? Um, both of those are quite feasible and there's, there's pheromones available to, to do that. And then you'd be combining that with using a biocontrol agent um, at the same time. So it would be working with those pheromones in combination. I'm not sure that's a complete answer, but hopefully it gives you some guidance as to where to look for how you could use the pheromone. Great, thanks Roma. And that's the end of our questions at this point. Um, I just want to say thanks to Ewa for sharing. Um, she's just shared some uh, an EPO uh, paper on biological control agents safely used around beneficials. So uh, thank you for really that. Helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. And we'll, we'll also collect those sorts of resources and put it into a final resource package for everyone. So look, there's been a lot shared across these um, three three sessions, a huge amount of detail. Um, Roma, just a massive amount of work and slides, I'd have to say, and, and information packed in each slide as well. And you've done a fantastic um, job. Uh, just before we end, um, I'd just like to really thank Valent Biosciences and Sumitomo Chemical for their sponsorship of the whole series. It's fantastic to, to have that support. And really, it's a really useful platform foundation for going forward and working out, okay, now specifically, how can we work um, to support you all uh, in this important area of work and regulation of biocontrol? Because it, it it's critical to actually making sure that farmers can um, have biocontrol and use it. And um, just so everyone um, is on the same page here, everyone needs support. So it's definitely not a... Um, it's definitely not any indication that you've got a weaker system or a poorer system than anyone else. Even the strongest uh, systems, uh, there's always ways that we can improve because it is a really complex area. It's changing. Um, as Roma said, there's new exciting um, developments coming through in the next five years as well. That Things that you may not have seen before, great to sort of check with others to see what they're doing and actually find out ways you can make improvements or actually get support. So we're looking forward to working with you all over the uh, coming months and, and um, thinking about what we can do further to really help you explicitly in some aspects uh, of your regulation where you think you could you could need a bit of support. Um, Roma, thank you. I'm just going to leave it. Roma, do you, maybe a last statement from you would be good before I close it. So I'm going to give you back the floor. OK, lovely. Alison, thank you very much for doing it. Yes, I, I've really enjoyed doing these sessions. What has really impressed me most was just the level of interest in biocontrol um, and the level of engagement in, in this. And um, I'm hoping that what we've done is to stimulate everybody to have a conversation with each other, because I think the more we can share knowledge, the faster we can move forward. And I really have been really impressed by how many people are interested in biocontrol. It's really great to see. Thank you. Yep. And thank you for inviting me to, to take part in this. No, you're most welcome. It's actually a pleasure to have you on board. And um, we're really privileged to actually have your expertise um, really helping to shape our work. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Putra, uh, in the background there, uh, also helping out. And um, I'd like to wish you all a um, rest, a good rest of the day, but also a good week in front of you. And we will see you back. And I will be in touch uh, personally with you all via an email with all the resources, uh, the video and um, to follow up. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.